evening and welcome to Meticulous Moment. My name is Yonita Kapp. You can reach me at meticulousmacarons at gmail.com or find me on LinkedIn. Since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the globe, I've had the wonderful privilege to meet a wide array of fantastic individuals. These individuals have truly touched my life in so many positive ways. Amongst this group of people, there are authors, public speakers, life coaches, poets, leaders and visionaries. They are the unsung heroes of our time. Therefore, I decided to start the Meticulous Moments movement out of a sense of my gratitude. It is my way of giving back to the community. Let us share and reshare their stories in an effort to build a better society. This evening, we get to spend time, are you ready, with the phenomenal, ta-ta-ta-ta, Freeman Bills, my wonderful friend, fellow musician, and father-to-be. I'll read a little bit more about Freeman. Freeman is busy spreading positivity. He's a public speaker, he's a positivity coach, and he is addicted to how our brains work. Wonderful, colorful individual has a lot to share about. Mm -hmm. Yes, white river rafting and everything in between. Let's have a big round of applause for our wonderful guest, Freeman Beals. Good evening, Meticulous Moments audience. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another enlivening session here at the Meticulous Moments podcast, where we facilitate community upliftment through leadership development. And this evening, we have the wonderful privilege of spending time with the amazing Freeman Beals. How are you, Freeman? I am so good. Thank you so much, Jay. It is an absolute pleasure of mine to be here. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it so much. First, tell me, did I pronounce your surname correctly? Yes, you got it. Yeah. I Wonderful, wonderful. That's always something I check up on because people have different, you know, ways of pronouncing it. Now, you and I met on LinkedIn. We belong to similar groups. I believe we know the same people. We had a lovely virtual coffee the other day, you know, discussing this interview, talking about leadership. So I feel like I know you already. But for the audience members who are not acquainted with you, would you mind just uh, greeting them and then, of course, tell them who you are? Of course, yeah. So good, I guess, day, morning, whatever time of day it is for everybody who's listening to uh, Meticulous Moments right now. Like I said, it's an absolute pleasure to be on here. Very excited. For myself, I guess a quick little who is Freeman Beals. Um, grew up small, rural town, kind of moved into tech and then found myself into where I am now, into the positivity space and my own personal branding. Um, and then just really kind of always been fired up to bring people positivity and happiness. That seems to be the theme that is kind of carried through my whole life and very excited to, as I kind of continue my mission to, to do that more. My goodness. And you know, if I look at our first encounter, even just talking on uh, LinkedIn, on the messenger part of it, you're always so happy, kind, <laughs> you know, lighthearted. <laughs> And I see you wearing your, your beautiful sweatshirt, then I'm thinking sunshine. So Freeman, that is your new nickname. You are sunshine because you just bring up. I'll take it. <laughs> that, is, that is part of the reason of the yellow sweater. It's very intentional. Um, part of what I do now feels very right. And I described it to somebody the other day as it feels like kind of being enveloped by the sun. I get that warmth out of what I'm doing. And this is sort of a subtle way for me to, to visualize that. Yeah. Wow, and that we did not talk about. I just picked it up. <laughs> so, so I'm happy. I'm very happy that that was spot on and, and it really suits you. It suits your personality. Thank you. And it suits who you are. So I, I'm very, very happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. And, uh, you know, meeting you has just been a journey. And you mentioned that you have a 365 positioning brand. Would you like to tell the audience about this wonderful concept? Of course. So the 365 positivity brand is something that sort of came out of a bit of my own personal development, my personal branding and stuff like that. 
And just something that I realized that is sort of needed a lot more in society now. There's so much negativity and being positive and being optimistic, something that I've been fortunate to just have sort of naturally, but I've learned over the years um, how to sort of harness it a bit better and what the tools are. I've been sort of back and forth on the positive positivity specter. You know, I think like everybody, I've sort of had dips. I'm not going to say my life has always been sunshine uh, and happiness, right? But learning the ways to get out of that had been big for me. So I started on a personal journey a long time ago now. Now, um, of posting on LinkedIn for 365 days. So I think I'm on day 230 today uh, of positive and educational posts. Um, so I haven't even gotten a whole year yet, but the idea behind that came out of this 365 positivity and this concept that positivity and happiness and living a more happy lifestyle isn't just something that you just decide to start doing. You don't just flip a switch and suddenly you're a happy individual, right? Um, obviously, there's a mindset mindset shift that has to be made, but also you can take into account small daily habits and practices that begin to shape you to be a more positive and optimistic individual. And I truly believe that there's so much benefit to that type of lifestyle. And it's just my passion to try to drive more people, give them those tools, give them the inspiration to also live a more positive lifestyle. Amazing. You are facilitating this platform where they can come and be better, come and yeah. be more positive. And that really speaks to the subconscious mind because that positive input, you know, it's kind of a reprogramming in a sense to change Completely. their negative outlook and reprogram them and make them winners. Yeah, 100%. Like I said, it's not – you can't just decide to start doing it, right? Yeah. One of my favorite – daily practices that you can do to start seeing more positivity in life is to just at the end of each day, write down three things that you thought went really well that day or that were positive or happy that day. And what that does is like you said, it actually begins to reprogram the way your brain looks at things and you begin to notice the positive and happy things more throughout your life instead of the negative things. And it's just, it's a simple write down three things that went well each day. And there's all cool types of, you know, um, studies that have been done that people, this is one of my favorite studies, is that people who've done this for only a week, for seven days, they were told to write down three things. And there was a control group that was told to write down just three neutral things. Didn't matter what the three things they wrote down. The seven, the group of people who were doing the positive things showed more happiness um, a week later, a month later, three months later, and even up to a year later on, even though they weren't writing it anymore. And not only were they happier, they were even healthier. They had less signs of illness, which is just to me is amazing. So it's not only were they physically, yeah. mentally feeling better, so, like physically, they were healthier individuals as well, just from, wow. just from that simple daily practice. Yeah. That's amazing. I want to read a study about how our voice have these waves that emit and how it influences everything that is saturated with water, for instance. And I mean, you and I know there's so much water inside the human body. And this whole study was about your words of upliftment shapes other people. Mm. It helps to either believe in themselves or it, it does the opposite, which is the wrong. So this is so big. What you are doing is so big, really. And the way that you are approaching it is so very practical. And that's powerful because it's not something that people sit and think, Oh, it's too difficult. They're not going to try it or they'll try it next week. They, they know they can really literally just take their pen and paper and write it down. And they are mm. done for them. Because what they write down is going to go into their subconscious. They're going to start speaking that. And what does the universe do? The universe reciprocates and sends that right back. Completely. Yeah. It's one thing that I've always been big on is obviously giving out positive messages is the one thing. And I think that's really important and something that should be done more often, but arguably more important than that is giving people the tools to do it. Right. Information is one thing, but giving people actionable things, that's what can really start to change people's lives. That's what I was thinking. The practicality of what you bring that is empowering them and it's giving them that skill. So I love it. I'm so happy that you're on day. 200 and city, you said. I mean, that, yeah. that must have been a journey and you probably get wonderful feedback. I do. Yeah. And I think it's, it, for me, it's what's really solidified it that I'm doing the right thing. Like I said, I feel like I'm really in the right space in my life doing what I'm doing right now, doing this. It feels like, for lack of a better term, a calling almost in a way, uh, as cheesy as that almost sounds. But I think for me, what it is, it's the feedback 
it's that feedback that I've gotten that really affirms to me that I'm doing it, the, doing the right thing. Uh, and not even just the likes on a post or the engagement that I get on social media. For me, it's more the smaller things that I get. So one of the big driving factors that I first noticed before I decided to become this, this positivity brand that I have, um, just doing the post, people would say to me in person and on messages on, on LinkedIn outside of the actual social um, interaction, just, Hey, thanks so much. You know, I really appreciate these, these things every day. I find, I see it and it makes my day that much better. And these are people that maybe haven't even liked or commented on any of my posts. Right. But they're seeing them. And that for me was huge. And then when I started my newsletter about a month into my newsletter, maybe uh, I started sharing it with like my friends and family and stuff like that. And I, a fairly close friend to me uh, sent me a message one day, um, oddly enough, right before I was supposed to stand up to do a bunch of speaking, they sent me this message. And I'm not exaggerating this. It was like 30 seconds before I was supposed to stand up. And the message just said, hey, thank you so much for your daily newsletters. I just want, or your weekly newsletter. I just want to let you know that it really helps me at the beginning of my week to get grounded and get ready for a positive week. And it's just, again, <clears throat> this person has never commented on myself, never liked my things. But that to me is the big difference. Those yeah. genuine changes in people's lives. I agree with you. And there's something that you said that's very, very true. And you realize that not everyone uh, always likes or comments, but they see and they hear and they apply. And there you have it. The proof is in the pudding. They actually reached out to you and they thank you for it. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. And to me, that's just the people who have maybe the courage or remember to actually reach out to me. The countless people who aren't doing that, who, I, who I'm impacting. I mean, yeah. I have no idea what those numbers look like. But the fact is, is if it's one person, that's enough for me to know that I'm doing the right thing. Amazing. I agree with you. That is, even if it's just that one person that the rest is changing and transforming and it's happening, but even just that one that to give that confirmation that really spurs you on and shows you you're heading in the right direction. So kudos to you on that. Absolutely love, love, love that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, during our virtual coffee, you mentioned that you grew up or lived in this rural town and your parents had the white river raft business there. And, you know, the dynamics just of that sport, I find it very interesting. Would you uh, bring some principles to the audience about what it entails? Uh, I always see it in the movies, but I've never gone white river rafting myself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's such an interesting topic for me. Um, I, I literally grew up doing it. My parents started the business when I was five years old. So when I was, as I was younger, it's kind of all I knew growing up. I was very much one of those kids because of that, thankfully, um, you know, that saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I very much lived that. We had lots of staff that were very much like family and the dynamic was like that. So I grew up with a lot of sort of mentors and in, important people in my life. Um but as far as the actual rafting thing goes, it's it's interesting. Like you said, you've seen it in movies and videos, and it's yeah. often portrayed as this really high adventure sport, right? It's intense, yeah. there's big waves crashing everywhere. But in my opinion, and when I was younger, that's what I thought as well, right? I was like, oh, this is high adrenaline, it's adventure, it's all about the excitement. As I got older, though, I realized that there's a lot more to rafting than just that. And the true magical and the true power of doing it is actually being out in nature in these amazing environments where you can't get to, there's no roads, right? Uh -huh. And you're in this environment with a group of people that you maybe you've just met, right? Yeah. And you maybe met them in the last hour. And I've been fortunate to do like, you know, multi-day overnight trips or and just single day stuff, which are a bit different dynamics. But what they all have in common is you bring these groups of people together and you get through a challenge together. And that bonds people, mm -hmm. right? When you get people through a challenge, they've, they've all put effort into it and they've come on the other side, they've had fun and they've smiled, they've laughed. That really changes people and enlightens people. And yeah. especially when you do it in an environment as magical as someplace on a river, right? Where there's, there's, yeah. there's flow and you can't, you can slow down, but you can't stop and appreciate everything, which I think makes it that much more special. It really yes. makes you want to live in that moment. And I highly encourage, like, I don't do a lot of commercial rafting anymore. I've sort of retired from it um, as I've kind of moved career paths and life goals and stuff. But I highly recommend anybody to go out and 
just do whether you do a float trip, right? You can do float trips where it's super calm and mellow and you can just enjoy being in the nature. Or if you are a little more adventurous, you can jump in and do something that's more extreme. But it's it's a really magical moment and I can't stress how uh how important it is to go do stuff like that. Just the way that you articulated that and explained that. My goodness. I think my <laughs> next holiday is gonna include wide river rafting. <laughs> do it. You'll you'll be hooked. So Nature. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's a lot safer than people think it is. I think that's part of what scares people away from it is it's deemed as dangerous. Yeah. Um, it's it's really not. It's no more dangerous than driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour, right? Or 60 mm-hmm. miles an hour. Um, it's in some ways, it's a lot more safer and, and controlled than that. Most places, I mean, do your research on where you're going and make sure they're accredited. Most places in the world have some sort of organization that controls what happens and who is deemed safe and who gets business license and stuff like that. But yeah. for the most part, it's a fairly safe sport, especially if you're doing something fairly um, mediocre level. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So audience, there you have it. It's not like <laughs> it is in the movies. It's not an action movie. It's actually something very therapeutic. Something to bring you into nature, bring you into the power of the present moment and to minister to you. So let's all book our White River Rafting vacation soon. <laughs> Do it. You won't, you won't regret it, I promise. <laughs> we'll definitely give you feedback, Freeman. We are going to give you feedback. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so I believe you and your beautiful wife met through your parents' in business. And how does that feel, you know, uh, you are going to have your first job together now and you are so happy together and your first baby is on the way. How does that feel to know that you're going to have this beautiful little Beals baby in the house? It's definitely exciting. Obviously a little nervous as well. First time parent. Um, I mean, I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous, but I definitely, I'm definitely excited. It's interesting. I think the growth, I think over the last five, six, eight years of my life, even if you were to ask me the same question five years ago, and if I was expecting then, I'd probably be a lot more nervous uh, and less excited, but I've had a lot of personal growth in the last five years and really changed how I outlook things and stuff like that. Uh, Like you said, I'm, I'm very grateful for the relationship I have with my wife. She's absolutely phenomenal. Um, We, I often, we often talk about this a lot of the times, just how grateful we we both are for our relationship. It's very stable. Um, we get along really well. We both have a very healthy give and take. I think that allows us, we, like I said, we've been together for nine years, going on 10 soon. So it's been really good. Uh, and I count my lucky stars every day uh, that I have that. And I think it's really interesting to bring, now that we're bringing in a another human into this world and sort of get to see what my influence and impact and both of our impact influence and impact the way that we live our life, the way that we approach things, what that will kind of do to shape a small human and, you know, how I can make that small kid kind of into the best and that they can be and who they want to be. And just to see them grow. I'm really, really excited for that, for the challenge of it as well. Obviously a bit nervous, um, but yeah. Well, I think, I think you're it up. <laughs> I think you're going to do just fine. And I know we talked about the gender and the names and everything. Would you like to tell the audience what is the surprise there? Yeah, for sure. So we're we're actually going to see the gender fairly soon here. I think it's in the next week and a half, I think, is when we go in to get our, our, what's sort of the last ultrasound before birth, uh, which is typically when you find out the gender and stuff like that. We'll probably find the gender out just from sheer... I have a bit of a logistical brain. So just from sheer logistics, I think it would be nicer to know what the gender is going to be so we can kind of figure things out and, um, (laughs) and stuff like that. We do, we have, we have some name, a name picked out, um, but that's what we're going to leave for the surprise for all of our family members and stuff like that is that is the name. So we'll let them know the gender, what makes it easier for people to buy gifts and stuff like that. But the name we're going to keep, keep to ourselves. And I mean, I've talked to friends who have had kids and they're like, oh, we've had different names and we didn't quite know what name it was going to be uh, until it came out. So that that could very well happen. Uh, but I don't think so. I think well, we're both pretty happy with with the name. So That's a wonderful way of approaching it. And you were talking about it's going to be interesting to see how you shape this little life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm so 
myself, yes, my goodness, being a parent is also being a leader because they are going to, your, you're going to see your little baby is going to be like a little sponge. They yeah. are go, he or she is going to soak up everything that they see and hear and experience. And that's leadership because we shape our children. We form them for the first few years of their life. So congratulations on that. I told you the other day, personally, I think it's going to be a boy. So if you find out the gender, the gender please let me know. <laughs> I will. I will definitely. Odd enough, both me and my wife, our guts instincts say girl. So I'm curious to see. I'll find out. I'll let you know. I'll let you know when we know. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be an interesting day. <laughs> yeah. Either, either way, like, I, in some, like, I don't care what gender it is. You know what I mean? Um, the baby's healthy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. No, thank you so much. And, you know, you talked a little bit about being uh, acquainted with freelance work entrepreneurship and how you hold it so close to your heart now tell us more about the stability of having a permanent job and how that really elevates and help us as entrepreneurs to develop our businesses then because i find there's a lot of entrepreneurs that i know myself included we have our day jobs but we build on that we build our our businesses logistically um, our entrepreneurship grows. So would you like to elaborate on that? Because I'm, I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the meticulous moments audience who would love to hear this. Yeah, definitely. I think entrepreneurship is an interesting thing, right? It's very, I don't want to call it new because it's been around forever, but I think it's definitely been highlighted a lot more in recent years. And that's got a lot to do with just the way that information is changing and how we discover things is changing. You know, we live in a, an amazing world where we have this ability to just look up the information we need online, right? Which really gives the power to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. Which gives that power to start something and create something to anybody really. And same with the cost of it, right? You don't need to take out a 10,000, 30,000 or higher business loan to start a business. You need a few extra hours a day and you need an Instagram and a Facebook and you create a brand for yourself and you just start doing it. Um, that being said, I think that, I think everybody should try a little bit of entrepreneurship. I think it gives you a really unique lens on the world. It, rem it lets you know really the true value of a lot of things, mainly your time. I think entrepreneurships are some of the people who really understand a, how much time they have and also how little time they have. It's uh -huh. almost both, right? You realize, oh, wow, like my time is valuable, not just on a monetary sense, but in the reality of how much time I have the day. And it makes you rethink how you spend your time throughout the day and what you're doing with it. And I think through that, you end up, I don't want to say wasting less time because I have an interesting relationship with recovery and stuff like that. And burnout is a real thing that you have to be yeah. careful about. Yeah. But it's recognizing within yourself, okay, this is a useful, um, a useful bit of my time versus I'm just, you know, spending time doing something that isn't actually moving the needle or getting me anywhere, which could be relaxing. Relaxing definitely moves the needle sometimes. Don't get me wrong there. Um, yeah. So in that sense, you know, like I said, if entrepreneurship is something that the listeners right now are thinking about doing, by all means, put your dip your toe in the water. It's really easy to do that nowadays. Um, you don't have to even leave your full-time job to start doing something on the side. The biggest thing that I've learned about it is it has to be something that you're really passionate about Yeah. because otherwise you won't do it. Mm -hmm. You can use motivation and you can try to build habits and schedules and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, if you don't, if you're not actually passionate about it, if you don't understand your why about why you're doing the thing that you're doing, you're going to stop doing it. You're going to run out of motivation. You're going to run out of that sheer willpower. It only lasts so long. So make sure that it's something that you are are comfortable with and that you want to do. Much like you are with this podcast, I imagine. It's something that you're passionate about, right? I think if your world was falling apart, you would try to find time for this podcast to go out. And that's why it's so powerful. And then with that as well, come the other side of that, which is you have to be willing and ready to both fail at what you're doing, but then also pivot off of that, right? Yes. Just because you started something and you're like, yeah, this is the thing that I'm going to do and it's great. And maybe you do it for three months or you do it for a year or something like that. But then you realize I'm, I'm not really enjoying this anymore, or uh, it's taking me too much of my willpower to do it. Then have a look at it, go, what parts of it were the, was I enjoying the most? 
and then pivot off of that and continually develop yourself. That's the, the key. You can fail a lot as long as you're developing and learning from it. Absolutely. I agree with you. And you know, uh, entrepreneurship facilitates that because mm -hmm. you will look at your, your entrepreneurial road and you'll see when you started and you said, well, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to do my own thing. I have my uh, normal job, but this is my passion. This is what I'm going to do. What does that do? When you cast that vision, when you start speaking about it, it stretches you in every area of your life, your faith, your, your skills, your personality, your contacts. It stretches you. It shapes you. It molds you. And it kind of, it creates us into the leaders that we are meant to be. And uh, I, would, I would say to people, keep your day job, people. Keep your day job and have more fun and enjoyment being an entrepreneur because then you don't have to worry about all the other stuff. A hundred percent. You're completely right there. And it's something that I have tried both sides of. And it's, you know, so when I moved away from the the family company of whitewater rafting and noted tourism into, into tech, I started as a user experience designer and I did some courses on that. Um, so my branding, and if you go way back into my LinkedIn, you'll see it, is trying to play both of those fields. I'm trying to push my freelance work and my business, but also still have this weird positive edge to things that I've kind of always done. Um, and it was really, really challenging. You know, there was definitely weeks where, I, you know, weeks, months, quarters where I didn't make a lot of money and stuff like that really kind of dipped into savings and, and all that fun kind of stuff. So it just puts a lot more pressure on it. So I think that there's a, there's a huge power to just doing it on the side. And then eventually, if you're really passionate about it, eventually, and what I'm hoping will happen eventually for my positivity brand, uh, let me rephrase that sentence. What will happen eventually with my positivity yes. brand I is that uh, <laughs> is that um, I'll have to stop working because I'll be so busy doing the brand and it will be able to support me. So oh, that yeah. that will be amazing when it happens. And I'll let you know when I hit that point. Um, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. But also too, I think on the flip side of that, I don't think there's... I think entrepreneurship is seen as like the pinnacle of, of what you can do. But that's not the case. There are hundreds of thousands of millions of people who are very happy individuals working for somebody else. And I can't understate the fact that if you go into entrepreneurship, like I said, you should try. If you think you're going to do it, give it a shot, but recognize when it's not working for you anymore and then be okay with that. And just understand that we all, we're not all of us are going to be entrepreneurs. Some of us are going to be really happy being oh, the fourth, yeah. fifth, sixth person in line on something. We can yeah. still live really good lives. And what that will often do for you is release the pressure of having to build something and create something and let you just pour it into a hobby instead. Wow. That's wonderful advice. Absolutely. I love the way you think about it. That's true. You coined mm -hmm. it correctly, articulated it well, and you, you make it known that it's okay. Not everybody has to be an entrepreneur. Some people want to be followers and some people are leaders and that's fine. We need all of mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, like, if if you think I, I want to be an entrepreneur, try it though, because what would be worse is living your whole life and getting to the end of it, going, you know, I never did try that. So give it a shot, try it for a year or whatever, two years. If it doesn't work, then go, you know what, maybe I'm maybe I don't like this. Maybe I'm not. Because there's a lot to entrepreneurship that people don't realize, right? It's not all as great as yeah. it takes a lot it's of the work, it takes a lot of dedication. You end up doing more than just the thing you want to do because you have to like I mean, if you're a solopreneur, it can be a little easier, definitely. But as soon as you have to start looking after people and employees and managing people and building systems, I mean, there's a whole other skill set that comes along with being a, a full-time entrepreneur. Absolutely. I mean, but you and I both The rewards know, are there. The rewards are there. Of course, it's yeah. worth it in the end. It does have a lot of late nights, early mornings, missed parties or missed family gatherings. Mm -hmm. It's an effort. You know, you have to put out your finances out there for certain projects. So it does stretch you in different ways, but it's worth it in the end. And I agree with Freeman. Give it a try because you have this idea in your mind. You never know. You never know. Yeah. like if, And the worst would be, like I said, not never doing it, right? Uh, there's so many people who say famous quotes about, um, I want to say it was, I think it's probably Tony Robbins who said something about, you know, there's two pains in life, um, the pain of regret and the pain of failure. 
and one of those is a lot heavier than the other one. And you know, failure goes away. You learn from it. But regret, it, you don't. You can't reverse that. <laughs> There's no way to reverse that. And I always tell people, I'm I'm a um, extroverted person and I decided long time ago in my life I'm not going to live with regret so if I feel like saying something I say it but I always do it with tact of course you know if it's maybe not such a positive thing but I never go to bed at night with that regret oh I should have done this or I should have said this or I should have made that phone call I always make sure because we really don't know what time we have left and I don't want to live with regret. I don't want to look back and say, oh, this or this or this. So I make it a point. And that's very true. Very true what you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Can't and like, talk. yeah. And I'm lying with that too. I think people, we have this amazing ability as human beings to foresee what we think the future is going to be like. Mm -hmm. But we're not very good at it is the problem. We yeah. often overplay or understate oh, both sides of it, right? <laughs> And so, I, and what, if you start doing smaller things, right. And then you realize that, oh, that wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be, you know, oh, texting that person or talking to that person wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Didn't have the ramifications uh, that I thought they were going to have because we're really bad at adjusting what those ramifications actually look like. Yeah. So just remember that for, for anybody listening, just remember that when you're thinking, oh, this is going to be, this is going to either turn out so badly or what are people going to think? It's always going to be less than you think it is nobody's nobody's going to notice if people do notice it's going to be way fewer than you think you're going to notice exactly and, and and that's true what you say we tend to overthink so much and it's like our brains are so cinematic you know we 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 uh, imagine these people to be these huge villains and we have to be scared of them or scared to say something meanwhile they're just normal people trying to do their jobs also just trying to get through the day and they're really harmless <laughs> I love the way you put that. That's exactly what it is. We do. We, we, we like, yeah, we have this cinematic idea of what life looks like in our brains. It's wild. And, but this is not, it's just not the case, yeah. you know, at all. It's not. I agree. I agree with you completely. And, you know, you're involved with project management. You work with people and mm -hmm. leadership is a very big part of that. So I wanted you to uh, explain to the audience, how does leadership tie in with your project management and how do you approach that? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of what I do is communication with people. Uh, and it's one thing that thankfully over, over the years, I've noticed I have the ability to communicate very well. Um, yes. A lot of that had to do with being being a raft guide for many years and talking with people. Um, I've just had to learn the skills of, of how to communicate effectively. The trick to communicating effectively and with this good leadership, in my opinion, is having a healthy level of empathy. Thankfully, I'm a very empathetic individual always have been um, just kind of who I am. And with that helps me become a lot better building relationships and being a better leader because I understand people. And that's the beauty with empathy. Empathy is not just, it's not just understanding people. It's really, you know, understanding, walking in their shoes, being part of it with them and sympathizing with them, right? Empathy and sympathy are not, are not the same thing. It's really at the core understanding why those issues are the way they are to people and with that as well that you'll be able to give people like the benefit of the doubt on something right you'll see both sides of a, of a field and that's really important especially in leadership um with a lot of what i do whether i'm dealing with clients or my or, or the um other people who work with me is it's like okay if i set a deadline for example i need to understand what the other person is going through what parameters they're under what work pressure they're under where they are headspace wise to make sure that that timeline is achievable because mm -hmm. otherwise it won't be met right i need to understand how they're feeling about something so that my feedback is set the right way because some people yes. you know some people take constructive feed cr criticism really well other people have yeah. to have it a lot lighter some people take that like, hey, you got to go do this. Hey, can you fix this thing? And you can just spit fire things to them and they're great with it. They respond really well to that. Some people you have to be a bit more gentle with. So understanding people and empathizing with them so that you know how they feel and react to things is such a huge part of leadership. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm thinking, you know, you're talking from a project management perspective, amazingly true. Every single point you made. And I can bring the ministerial perspective from here and I can say it's true. Some people 
you can just say it like it is and they're fine and we move on. Other people, you have to have a certain way of phrasing it because their personalities are different. Their worldviews mm-hmm. are different and they like to be approached in a certain way. And that's the skills that you and I picked up. And that's a very important skill, but it's not an easy skill to learn. No, it's, it's really tough. It takes, like anything that's tough, it takes practice to do. It yeah. takes screwing it up, doing it the wrong way. I've, I've made mistakes in leadership. There's no doubt about it. I can look back at whole seasons of my life and I'm like, oh boy, I did not handle that well. <laughs> but that's key, right? That self-reflection and going, okay, how do I do it better next time? Right? How do I better every, every time I do it? And I think a lot of that comes back. I was thinking about this um, this morning, actually, because I have, I'm speaking in an engagement tomorrow on leadership, oddly oh, enough. Wow. Um, and I was like, yeah, which is kind of convenient um, and just weird that it happened at the same time. Um, so I was thinking about it today, about the speech that I, I plan to give and stuff like that. And I was like, where does it all come from? Where does it come Like, Where in my history of my life have this come from? And to circle all the way back around to the rafting, a lot of it comes from there. That That's leadership. It's taking people into uncomfortable situations, controlling um, the situation and making them feel comfortable and confident in what's going on. And you have to tailor each group that would come out slightly differently. Obviously, your group of 21-year-old bachelor party, they want to have a different trip and need a different leadership style than your family with mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, and four kids. Those are very different trips. Same section of water, same river, same half hour or same half day trip, but drastically different leadership um, approaches. Amazing how you took the principles of white river rafting that you learned and you apply them in project management. And I'll tell you why I say it's amazing. I do that with martial arts. Mm. I take the so arts that I do, the jiu-jitsu and the fighting that we do, and I take it over to my business. And I take those principles like you take those principles and I apply them. And that can only happen when you decide you want to be a lifelong learner, you want to develop personally and professionally, and what are the outcomes that you and I want, Freeman? We want the best for everybody. That's what's the same for us, even though we are in different fields. We want the best for everybody. And how do, we, how do we facilitate the best? By developing ourselves. Our 100%. Skill. Yeah. Yeah. I think, so because I'm a really empathetic individual, for a long time, I gave a lot. And I still do. I still give a lot. But I had this epiphany moment as I was working through some workshops on, um, on self-development. And it was this epiphany that the more I can better myself – the more I can better others. Exactly. And it, it led me yeah. to my favorite mantra, which is usually used for economics, but I really like using it for self-development and positivity. It's a, rise, a rising tide lifts all ships. Oh, I've heard so that before. The, I love that. Screw, uh, that yeah. I, always say, I love that saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the better I can be as myself, the, the more I can do, means the more I can give and the better everybody else is going to do as well. And that... When I realized that, I was like, okay, I need to make sure that I am paying attention to myself a lot so that I can make sure that other people are also benefiting from it. That right there that you described is the description, the definition of authentic leadership. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I love that. And your approach is just amazing how you work with people now. I see that beautiful guitar behind you. And I know there's a fiddle there on top of that bookcase. Yeah. And I want to, you know, I want to talk about, you talked about playing instruments and we both play guitar. I also play acoustic. And you also, you you play the fiddle. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So I need to play more of the fiddle. I don't, I haven't played the fiddle in decades now. Um, My one claim to musical fame is that when I was five, maybe younger than that, um, is when I started to learn the fiddle and I could read music before I could read words. And interestingly enough, that still sits in my brain a little bit. I I can still sort of understand music, um, very musically kind of inclined. I understand beats and percussion and the flow of music and stuff like that. I don't play as much as I wish I could. 
But what I do really, and I actually, oddly enough, it's funny that you bring this up because I just wrote my newsletter that went out this week with on music and the importance of it in our lives. Because I think that music has this amazing power. There is yeah. so much to it, especially things like live music. Um, when you get it in person, there's an energy to it that just yeah. you do not get. Yeah. And it has this amazing ability to make us feel certain things, sad, happy, energized, relaxed, right? All of these things can happen through music. But my favorite thing with music um, is how it brings us together. And this is the coolest thing with music because it doesn't matter who you are, what race you are, your political views, your gender, your age even. When a good piece of music is being played live, people stop and pay attention. And it is phenomenal to see that to see the change on people's faces as they just allow themselves to be absorbed in that level of experience. There's nothing really else other than maybe storytelling that kind of has that impact on people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's almost like we are hypnotized into that state of, you know, flowing with the music and just being with and storytelling. If you think about it, it's also a type of, you know, taking people into a story land and taking their attention away from their surroundings and focusing it. So there's so many things out there that I find so interesting. And there's so many people with, with skills to do the storytelling and the music making. So I said to you in the virtual coffee, I think you should start playing again because I know the Beals baby is going to be insanely musical. Yeah, it's definitely something that I'm moving up my priority uh, ladder. Um, over the last few weeks, I've been slowly trying to get more and more onto it. Um, yeah. I do wonder too, though, as well, I'd like to, because I haven't hit the point yet where I can play in that sense of flow. So I can see what it does to people that are listening, but I'm actually really curious to hear from you what that feels like from your perspective as the one producing the level of music and seeing the impact it has around you. Yeah. Well, I love, you know, when I, I'm a very spiritually inclined person and I've always been a worship leader as well, being a pastor. And for me, when I take my guitar and I strum that first note on a Sunday, it's something, it's just, it flows over me. And it's like I'm in another world. And it just brings that inner joy. And for me and for you, and I heard it in, in what you've been explaining, music puts me in another space. If I sit and work and it's quiet, I love my work and it's amazing. But the moment I put on music that speaks to me, it feels like I'm so much more focused and, you know, into what I'm doing and passionate about what I'm doing at that moment. And music really flows through all of us. I know Louis Giglio, Giglio I hope I say his surname correctly, he did a whole study on the, the fact that the universe makes a constant sound. It makes music. And they actually he and Chris Tomlin went, one of the gospel singers that I, singers that I know, and they made a song. They produced a song from that music that was picked up from the universe. And that song's name is How Great Is Our God. So mm. it makes sense that if the universe is making music all day and we are part of it, that music will minister to us, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in, in that that I really love. There's a level of energy that we probably don't even understand, really, um, which I could get into all types of yeah. the fact that we can't see yeah. it, but can still I feel it, it or can't even hear it potentially. But it reminded me of, I just saw this video the other day on this person who was plugging electrodes into mushrooms oh. um, and, then, and then synthesizing the sound that was coming out of the electrical impulses of the mushroom and turning it into music. And it was incredible. I have to, like, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. It's really cool. Never heard and that of just it. Goes right to it. That that's the same principle. So it's up there, mm -hmm. it's here down with us. And I agree with you. Energy. We are made of energy. You know, Freeman. If I had to say the word energy, universe, or anything like that in the church ten years ago, my goodness, there would be a big <laughs> because they didn't understand that mm. every energy, energy doesn't. You can't diminish energy. It can only be transferred. 
It's here and it is here to stay. So I love that. I'm going to go look for that study about the mushrooms because I would love to see that. And I believe that. I've, I've mm-hmm. read so many things and I never knew. My goodness, mushrooms of all things. Yeah, they're making, making little music for us. Yeah. Woo! Sounds like that Trolls movie where they made all that beautiful <laughs> music. <laughs> they were running around in the mushrooms. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, Freeman, please share with us. I mean, you've got a fantastic list of hobbies. Please share with the audience the hobbies that you enjoy. I, I enjoy tremendously hearing about the hobbies. Yeah. So because I grew up in a small town, it means I was outside a lot. Um, so I obviously, I still do a lot of whitewater sports. I still kayak. I've been kayaking since I was 14, yeah. I think. So I still do that a, a lot. Still get out and raft with friends and family when I can. Um, I started rock climbing up around the same age. I was probably 14 when I started rock climbing. Never really did a lot very seriously though. Just did it kind of once or twice a year, uh, with my stepdad. Thankfully, my wife also started rock climbing young when she was 12. She started rock climbing. Um, so where I am super passionate about water sports, she is probably about the same level passionate about rock climbing. So we, uh, we do a lot of rock climbing together. Um, it's something as well. That's super easy to do with small children. We can bring the baby to the crag, and as long as there's a couple of people to watch it, you know we can climb, and the baby can just hang out. So we're really excited to just kind of keep doing that kind of stuff um, with with the kid. Lots of other outdoor sports that kind of just go along with that as well: hiking and backpacking, oh. multi day backpacking trips, and snowboarding and skiing and snowshoeing. And it's part of why we live where we live in Canada. It's part of why my wife could never see herself living back in the UK again because so much of what we love to do is. There. pretty much right outside my back door wow and what i find interesting is both of you have such a zest for life you know you want to <laughs> go and do and and i know the bills baby is going to be there uh, watching you from the little crib while you rock climb or while you snowboard and it's just going to be an amazing adventure wonderful list of hobbies you are very adventurous and I like that. I always people always say I'm an adrenaline junkie because uh, I love extreme sports. And someone actually asked me, I was doing a keynote speaking engagement a few weeks ago for a leadership academy group that I belong to. And I used focus and illustration and I talked about knowing the real from the fake. And I did this whole thing. I'll send you the link and at the end, they, they were able to ask me questions because they know I'm a martial artist and I love to skydive and I do motorbikes and you know, I love hiking. And the one person asked me because during my speech, I was talking about trusting your gut. And how mm. do you trust your gut? You trust your gut by exercising it because you need to know what feels right and what feels wrong. And that doesn't happen overnight. And uh, one of the people asked me, when do you not trust your gut? And I said, well, I have the answer for you. For me personally, because I'm an adrenaline junkie, if I want to do something dangerous, I don't trust my gut because I'll just go. And And he had such a laugh. So now absolutely love your list. And I, I, I speak a blessing over you and your beautiful family to enjoy all of those activities together. That's amazing. Oh Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Freeman. Now, leadership is a huge part of being an entrepreneur. You know this. And how how does having a go-get attitude, how does that affect your results? Uh, you know, the results that you see, your vision and your mission. Does it help to have a go-get attitude? Is there, a, you know, how would you elaborate on that? Yeah, awesome question. I love that. I mean, it's it's quite important to have that go-get attitude. And with that, of course, comes that understanding that you might fail at something, right? Because again, another amazing quote is that um, if you never if you never if you never do, you'll never you never fail, right? If you never fail, you'll never try. So you have to be willing to try, you have to be willing to fail, because otherwise you're never going to start doing anything. So you have to have that go-get attitude to start going out there and just doing things. And that would be like my biggest message to people when it comes to that kind of stuff is to just start, you know, um, done is better than perfect and it will change and it will adapt whether it's posting on social media. Yeah. Whether it's posting on social media, whether it's public speaking, whether it's creating a business, all of these things, you, you're going to suck at them at first. 
we all sucked at something at first, right? Of One of my favorite things, and I have no idea where this came from in my life, but I thought of, you know, if we treated the way that we approach new things, like we treat babies when they first start to walk, we would all do a lot more and vice versa. If we drop, if we treat babies the same way that we treat somebody who tries something new, humans would never walk exactly. because the minute you fall down, we'd be like, oh, don't try that anymore. You're just going to fall down and hurt yourself. Right. Yeah. But no, what do you do? They fall down. You encourage them to get back up, to try again. You give them little bits of support and you change the level of support as they grow and mature and get better at things. That's yeah. the same way we need to treat the things that we start doing. You have to just start putting one foot in front of the other one and be prepared yeah. to fall on your face. And that's okay. Yeah. Get back up again. That's see if there's somebody around that can help you. Ask for help if you need it. People are seem to be crazily um, opposed to asking for help because they see it as a sign of weakness. And it's not. Asking for help is a huge showing of strength. It shows I'm not giving up. I want this thing so badly that I'm willing to go find somebody to help me get it. That's strength. That's not weakness. So I yeah. think that that go-getter attitude, just start doing it. Go out, try the thing, right? Because you'll never know. If you never do, you'll never know. And again, to go back to the whole regret thing, right? Um, a lot of people talk about how important it is to, if you ever think, hmm, is this something I should try? I'm not sure if this should be something I should do. Go spend some time at a an old folks home at a end of care center mm -hmm. and talk to people like that and ask them. They've done all sorts of studies behind this kind of stuff. The number one thing people have is the thing that they've regret doing. So just do the thing, try it. You know, True. if you don't like it, stop doing it, but at least you've tried it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I agree with you completely the way that you, that you phrased it. I do. And we all suck at something when we start doing it at first. Mm -hmm. It's normal. That's why we have to learn. I always say to the children that I, you know, I, I have uh, been homeschooling my kids for many years, but some of their friends would come to me as well to help them with their homework. And some of them would get so frustrated if they don't get it, to, you know, right the first time. And I would say to them, but why do you need a teacher then? Why is there then a school system <laughs> if you wake up and you just know everything? I mean, we all learn, you know, and then they, yeah. they, they lighten up a little bit and they realize there's practice, you know, there's, there's formulas that they need to learn by heart and just apply. And sometimes there's information that they need to learn by heart. But it's a, it's, a, it's a process. So absolutely love that. Thank you so much for that answer. Love, love, mm -hmm. love. Deep. Now, the sports that you mentioned, your passions, your vigor, all point to the fact that you're a strong leader. And I have yet to answer you, where did your leadership journey start? Yeah, so definitely, like I said, it, for me, it, was, it started with the rafting. And I think that's where the... And, Part of it, maybe because I was so young, I didn't even realize that I was sort of being a leader in a way. It wasn't until I got older that I realized, oh, this is, I'm, I'm taking leadership responsibilities here. Um, and I'm really, even before that, so in, in Alberta, where I live in Canada, you have to be 18 to legally guide. That's, that's law. Oh, okay. Interesting. But before that, obviously, I was involved in the company and doing things. And I think even at 15, 16, probably, I was in charge of things. So it was, hey, can you make sure that this is being done properly or look after this or, you know, um, hey, make sure your friends are showing up on time to work because a lot of my friends worked for the business as well. So I was just sort of, for better or worse, kind of thrust into leadership almost in a way. And I took it very well. Uh, and it's carried on through a lot of a lot of my life, but that's probably where it started. With when I was quite young, with the rafting company, is when I realized that yes. the leadership was something that uh, I just grew up in, into doing. But like anything, it's it's something that can be taught. It's something that was practice mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the right mentorship and the right information that you can get you can get better at. But like everything, you have to start. You have to just start doing it. Just start, and the big thing is to start. Because mm. often people have these dreams and say, oh, my goodness, I still one day I want to do this and this and this and this. Let me tell you something. The time is never going to be perfect. Just start. You'll figure out the rest as you go along. It's going to mm. shape you. It's going to stretch you, like I said earlier, but it's going to be a fun ride. It's going to be an amazing <laughs> journey. <laughs> yeah, and it's part of, the, part of that issue 
is so there's two things i mean i love th- what the internet has done to the world because it's given you the ability to go find the tools to do the things right unfortunately yeah. what it's also done is it's kind of created social media and the ability to see people who have already succeeding so we think yeah. that in order to start we have to produce things at a level that the successful people are doing it at and it's like well you're you didn't see the 10 years of struggle that they got to get to that point because Six. of the way social media is right and so, so it's just remembering that that you need to start somewhere as well and it's going to be a process for you and then learn to love that process if i look at where i am now with my positivity brand It is only where it is now because of the process that I've used to build it to where it is. It was nowhere. I couldn't even have thought that it is what it is now a year ago because the process is what's brought it out. True. I'm thinking of that and I'm sure you've also seen that on LinkedIn. It was a post, I'm not sure which year, but it was the iceberg. And then it showed under the water how big the iceberg under the water really is. And it was listing all the struggles and the trials and the tribulation. And then big, you, you just see on the surface, you just see the success. But everything else that came with it, mm-hmm. everything else that led up to that success, my goodness, it's, yeah. it's something to go through. Yeah. yeah. And I think you have to go through that because what happens if you don't go through that? Let's say somebody just hands you the reins to something, right? Or they give you the huge, big step up. When you're confronted with an issue or you need to grow it more or something like that, you don't have the tools and the knowledge to do that, right? You've only got what you were ever given. So I think it's important to build. Yeah. And it's important to, to fall in love with the process because what happens if we don't fall in love with the process is when we reach the goal, we think that and this is something I'm usually passionate about. When we reach the goal, we think, okay, cool. Now I have the thing. Now I can be happy and successful. But that's not the case. The happiness and success happens during your approach towards the goal. And that's what we have to fall in love with. And that's the brilliant book. Yeah, there's a brilliant book and I highly recommend everybody read it. It's called The Happiness Advantage. And it proves and shows all the science and studies behind the fact that it is not success that leads to happiness. It's completely the other way around. It's happiness that helps lead you to success. I love it. I love it. So success is not the destination, it's a journey. And so is leadership. 100%. You're never mm-hmm. going to get to that place because you keep on going, keep on going. But it's mm-hmm. in that moment, those meticulous yeah. moments, that you find that joy and laughter and sunshine. Yeah, you're never going to be the perfect leader. You're always going to be learning to be a better leader. You're going to learn different tactics and different ways. And you're, again, like you said very early on in this, you need to grow yourself. That's part of it, right? The minute that you think you've got it all figured out is the minute you need to go, wait, I don't. I need to start seeing how I can better myself and and better my team and the people who I'm leading. We never have it completely figured out. I agree with you. No. And which is something else I learned from being a raft guide, right? Like I had to portray a level of confidence so that my team, the people in the boat paddling would feel confident in what I was doing. I can tell you 100%. There were times when I wasn't hundred percent sure of what was going on, but you maintain that air of confidence and that maintain <laughs> that air of like, you know, Oh, I know what's going on. Right. And it comes from training. Um, yeah. Right. And you fall back on the training and stuff like that, that you've taken into but consideration. Go but, that. Yeah. yeah. And not everything would go to plan. And that's a huge thing that being a raft guy taught me is that not, it, it will never go to plan. The true exactly. sign of good leadership and, and good raft guides is the people who know what to do when the plan fails. And that's ultimately what makes really good leadership. That's a very powerful statement. Just repeat that for the audience. That's a very <laughs> powerful statement. For sure. The sign of good leadership isn't the ability to have a good plan. It's the ability to make something happen when the plan when the plan goes wrong. I'm not 100% sure how I said it the first time, but I... Yeah. Yeah, is to make sure you know what to do when the plan goes wrong because none of mm-hmm. us can predict what will happen in life. And things will happen, right? Things will go wrong. So it's your ability to get past that. That's what it was. It's your ability to get past it when things go wrong that makes good leadership. There we go. I love that. That's a new quote. Freeman Got Beals. It. Write it down. <laughs> yeah, write it down. It's a Freeman Beals quote. I'm going to put it in our post. I love it. Absolutely I love, love it. it. Beautiful.
Now, you're very focused on relationship building, and so am I because of the pastoral side and you as a project manager. How has this helped you to lead others well? Oh, so much. Um, again, to go back to, to empathy, right? I think building relationships is about that as well. Ultimately, ultimately leadership is about relationships. Yeah. You have a relationship with the people that you're leading and understanding the better you understand everybody in that relationship, the more you foster it, the more you build trust and communication levels, the more that you can be on the same page as the other people that you're leading, the better overall your team is going to be. It's the same concept. One of my favorite things is like, you know, and, and it takes time because one of my favorite things is the fact that you don't trust you can't just expect relationships to just happen. And it's the same thing in um, whether it be a loving relationship or a business relationship. They take time. They take time to foster. They take dedication from both sides and stuff like that. But as a leader, I think it's ultimately your job to sort of start that process of building that relationship. Do the things, bring people in for reviews, be hyper aware of how people are feeling and when the best time to approach them is. Notice when a team member or somebody isn't necessarily responding the way that they used to and notice those subtle um, emotional shifts in the way that they're behaving and then make time to meet with that person and talk to them about what's going on with them. Because ultimately that's what it takes to build a good relationship and it's what it takes to be a good leader, right? Is making time for the people that you know are, are really important. Mm. I love it. You said that it doesn't happen overnight. That's true. Because trust doesn't build overnight. And what is a relationship without trust in any type mm -hmm. of relationship, work or personal or any other area? That trust yeah, doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah. And trust is huge, especially in leadership. I've always been big at building trust with, and this is the thing is trust is a two way street. Trust and respect are both two way streets, right? They have to be given a take. One of the reasons I love teams that trust each other really well, I had to have it again back at the, at the, at the rafting guide. I had to trust my team. I had to trust not only the people in my boat, but I had to trust all of my employees. If something goes wrong on the river, I have to trust that they know how to handle that, right? So I naturally had to learn the ability to trust what other people were doing. The reason that trust is so powerful in leadership, though, is that it makes it more efficient. The minute that you don't trust people, now you have to micromanage. They don't feel like they can do the things they're going to do. They're going to stop working on something to make sure that it gets checked, and you're going to lose efficiency over time. So it's really important that you have that trust so that things can get done in a timely manner without a continual amounts of balances and checks. And if you yes. don't trust each other, you can't do that. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely true. It's fundamental. Fundamental. Mm -hmm. I wish so many more corporations would focus on the people before they focus on the goals. Because 100%. if you look after the people, and you know what's happening in their lives and you have interest in what they do, the goals will automatically be reached with joy. But if you only focus on the goals, then the people feel neglected and they are start, slow to start and they don't have that passion anymore. And so it's this negative cycle. We are working with people. We'll always work with people. Let's build relationships like you and I said. Let's build them up. Let's help them. Let's learn how to work with them. And then, of course, everything else from there will flow naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen leadership positions um, where that hasn't happened and you can see the, the degradation of work and workmanship yeah. and trust and how much gets done. Um, so it is, yeah, it's vital. Beautiful. You mentioned your weekly newsletter. Mm -hmm. How can we uh, get signed up for it? For sure. So I hosted on a program called Substack. So on my in my almost every one of my socials, I'm pretty sure. I know for sure on my LinkedIn, there's a link directly there that you can click and allows you to to sign up to the newsletter. The nice thing about Substack is it lets you look at the you can have a look through all the articles before you decide to sub subscribe. Amazing. And they're all there as well. So you can wow. get you'll get it every Monday. It comes out at um seven AM um mountain time or uh six AM Pacific time uh, every okay. Monday. But then you can also go back onto the platform and read the older ones. 
if if they oh, interest you. That's good. Yeah. So there's a there's a uh, all the other ones that you've done before. Also, this you you can get a good uh, catch up in the archives. That's wonderful. Yeah, and those newsletters are again like a lot of what I do. I feel like it needs to be actionable and stuff like that. So they're obviously yeah. very motivational, inspiring, but they include that information that you need as well. And I always give links out to podcasts that maybe I find inspiring to help me write the articles, books I've read and stuff like that to give people more to keep going as well. So it's not just a newsletter that you kind of get, you get an idea on the resources that I've been using to build them as well. Love it. Absolutely going to do that, going to follow you and I will make that available in the post as well. And I mean, our hour has just flown by (laughs) because we had such a lovely discussion. And I'm down to the last two questions. And they are, firstly, what is next for you? And secondly, do you have any words of wisdom for the audience? Love it. So first one, what's next for me? It's It still is a process of building. Um, I'm very passionate about my newsletter uh, and about my own pos- podcast that I'm doing to help bring the tools and information Perfect. to more people. The next things that I really want to get into, though, is the idea of building a positive community that people can be part of online where they can go with their problems and have people answer and get the kind of tools that they need on a permanent basis to, you know, live a more positive lifestyle. And the other thing that I guess there's a few things, more public speaking as well, um, getting in front of more people, just that ability to get that message out even farther, right? The farther I can create that ripple effect, the better. And then uh, positivity coaching is something that I'm seriously considering as well. Working one-on-one with people to help them live a happier, healthier lifestyle. Love it. And yeah. all of this you're doing to uplift others to build. And uh, we commend you on that because you are really spreading the sunshine. And, you know, we live in a time, difficult time, where people, they suffer with fear and anxiety and they're disassociated because of COVID and they went through a lot and we need more leaders like you, definitely, mm-hmm. to bring that, you know, which you are offering. Yeah. And as far as I think something that I guess people people should remember and, and take, the, the one takeaway, I suppose, from all of this yeah. would just be to remember that there is positivity out there in the world. And even if you don't see it, the ability to start nurturing in yourself how to see that positivity, how to look more positive, positive, how to have a more positive outlook is possible for all of us. There is no, I'm just a negative individual. That's not a thing that exists anymore. Um, you have the ability to change the way that your brain looks at the world. And that's what it, it comes down to. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is this idea that when you go out and you're, you're looking for gold, you have to dig through a lot of dirt but you don't look at the dirt, you look at the gold and that's the biggest thing. True, keeping that focus. I heard someone say the other day, where your focus goes, your energy flows. You must be very careful of how, how are you positively inclined, are you negatively inclined and how is that actually influencing your life path? Because if you just focus on positive, Everything is going to be reciprocated from the universe. You know, you will receive that joy and love and care. If you only see what's bad and what's wrong, if you go looking for something that's wrong, you'll find it. So Mm -hmm. really just changing that. And we had a phenomenal, phenomenal time with you this evening. Thank you for brightening up this session and this day and this podcast. We appreciate you and we, we speak God's blessing over you, your beautiful wife and your baby on the way. And uh, it's just a an adventure. Oh, thank you so much. I've appreciated so much being on here, Jay, and chatting with you. And I hope that we get to do a lot more chats in the future here because I've been absolutely loved this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Freeman. Absolutely. I think we'll definitely have to do a sequel to this session. I mean, that was just <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much. Meticulous moments. We had such a wonderful time with you, audience, as well. Thank you for joining us, for enjoying this discussion, for getting some information from learning and growing with us. And we will be back in the next session, but we'll also make available Freeman's contact details and social media handles. And you know what to do. Follow him on social media and network with him and support him on this wonderful leadership journey. We'll see you in the next session. Goodbye.